I'm uh, going to talk on a completely different topic. Uh, I wasn't aware when I agreed to make this presentation that the theme was taxes, but I'll return to that later on. But I'd, I'd like to, to start with this picture of a, uh, that's a submarine of the Golf class, Soviet, K-129, I see a terrible mistake here. This uh, submarine sank in the uh, Pacific in 1968. And uh, of course, the Soviets started looking for it. Uh, they didn't know exactly where it had sank because those submarines are always traveling without contact with head office. Uh, so the Americans saw that there were lots of Soviet vessels in that part of the Pacific and they started, well, that must be something which has happened. And they managed through their, I think, underwater sonar systems to localize this sunken uh, submarine. And uh, it, you see there is the cross there where, where the Americans found it. That was, it sank in March and the US managed to pinpoint where it was in May. And the intelligence organization started to thinking, how shall we be able to take this submarine out of the Pacific, I think it was four or 5,000 meters deep, without the Soviets noticing and understanding that we know where it is? That's a bit of a, a, a difficult issue. And uh, so they started a long-term project which involved deep sea bed minerals. And uh, they managed, CIA managed to engage Howard Huge, you know, this eccentric billionaire. And uh, uh, he invested, or if it was the CIA, of course, and, and was the story spread that we are now going to look for nodules in the Pacific. And uh, uh, this was at a time, uh, you know, the early 70s, when the mid 70s, when the oil companies had made huge sums of money for, from the price shocks of OPEC, and they wanted to move into mining in the second part of the 70s. And this was very hot topic. And uh, I, I, as you can see, I'm a very old man. I was. Uh, working on these issues in our little raw materials group in those days as well. And although we were sort of investigative journalists or, you know, trying to find the truth, we were also completely um, taken by these CIA ideas. And uh, so it, it is interesting in, in retrospect to think a bit about how much of the interest in deep sea bed mining was due to this submarine and how much was really due to technical and economic situation and the demand for those metals and minerals. I'm, I'm not a uh, person that that's, I, I don't like these sort of uh, hypothesis and but I think in this case there is a, a certain it's a, a thing to think about because the deep seabed mining and and what I'm going to tell you now is part of a study which wider uh, asked us to do uh, how much is is or oh really let me change it the technologies and the optimism about seabed mining has been f flowering and exploding over sev several times over the past 50 years, but nothing has really happened. So uh, I think this is uh, a very interesting question. Uh, and let me, in addition to what Alan here told, me, told you about my history, I would also like to mention that, um, and, and this is a a lesson of life for myself. I was part of a, a little collective starting this journal in 1980. Uh, now, in 2023, I'm still the editor-in-chief, so never start a journal. <laughs> but I, 
I, I would like all of you who are working in the field of minerals and metals and policy and economics to contribute, send your stuff to us. We are one of the most highly, highly valued journals. I enjoyed very much the introduction yesterday by the boss of, of the NORAD. And he said in, in Norwegian, facts or fakta or er makta. And he translated, I think, a little not, not to the point. To me, facts are power. And he said something, he enveloped that a bit. So, but that has been the, the basis for the raw materials group in, in since early 70s. And that's why we built a database over all mines and metals, as Alan said. Uh, when retiring 10 years ago, we had to sell the database. But if you want to approach or use it, it's still with Standard & Poor's, their sortiment. My agenda is short. What is marine mining? And then deep sea bed mining, which is part of the marine mining, and some observation, which I will hope provoke a lot of discussion. Tony has told me, don't worry about a lot of slides, just provoke. He didn't say exactly like that, but that was his intention. So here you have uh, the, the, the seabed and, and, the, the, and, and let me I go to the next slide directly. <clears throat> what is there on the continental shelf? That is what we call offshore mining. Then we have on the sea of the bottom, ocean floor. That's the rest of this picture. Those are the polymetallic nodules. Um, the, the, um, along the Atlantic mid-oceanic -oce ridges, there are uh, seafloor massive sulfides, the SMS, and there are nodules and other stuff. And I will get back to that a little later, because that's where Norway is now heading to ex extract from, from the mid-Atlantic ridge. And, and uh, the depth here is four, three, four, five thousand meters. And I just added, you know, far to the right, the depth of the deepest gold mine, which is also around 4,000 4, meters, just outside uh, Joburg. But of course, that starts at, at uh, 1,500 or 1,000 meters, which is the altitude in, on, in the Witwatersrand. So um, these are the possibilities, and, and I'll talk a bit more about that in, ah, here we are. This is uh, what marine mining there is in the world. The, um, let me start with the deep seabed mining. You see there, Clarion Clippertone zone in the middle there, the Naur, Nauri D1. D, sorry, one is the, you see the note there. That's a deep seabed mining where a company called the Metals Company is engaged. Then there is Cook Islands further south. There are more projects around there. And a little up towards Japan is the uh, Japanese Jogmek state organization doing work uh, outside of Okinawa, uh, which is on um, uh, the um, national territorial waters. And finally, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where Norwegian companies hope to do some uh, extraction, which is also in the Norwegian economic exclusive economic zone so it's it's outside of the uh the clarion clipperton zone is is uh, under the uh, leadership of the international seabed authority so that's the uh, projects of deep seabed mining nothing is going on yet and all the others are offshore mining which is in, on the continental shelf and not so deep waters. And I, I'd like to point out uh, the, um, uh, you see there in, in outside the Namibian coast, diamonds. I think Namibia has done a, a very interesting work, a bit like Botswana. It's a 50-50 venture with De Beers, and they have mastered to some extent the seabed mining problems and issues. And they come quite far in that area. There are also projects to, to take up phosphorites, phosphor-containing 
material there from. All the others are uh, sand, tin in, in, uh, in the Southeast Asia, some iron ore mining in New Zealand, and there are some projects around the world uh, which uses offshore, that is near to land resources. Sand and gravel is by far the most common. Here is a, a, an illustration of the, the, the value of marine extraction and really only offshore because there hasn't been any deep seabed mining. And you can see uh, oil and gas is indicated on the top there as a, as a, a point of comparison. Etienne, you might have some views on that. Welcome for, to the question session later. Uh, and, and you can see that I've summed it up. There's some $35 billion is the value. If you subtract the sand and gravel, $15 billion remains. And that is about 1% or 2% of the total value of non-fuel minerals produced in the world in 2018. So it's, it's a fairly small share, but it has increased over this period. The, the 1972 uh, figures were given by a, a study, and, and we did the 2018 figures. The, um, the deep seabed mining is attracting a lot of interest, and, and I'll discuss that a little later, how, how, how realistic is it really? But um, apart, never mind that, this is a list of the exploration contracts the International Seabed Authority has made uh, until it's, it's uh, two years ago. But you see, it, it covers about 0.7% of the uh, total area of the, the seas. And if you, if one, it's, it's in total how many, uh, well, 50, a little less than 50, 30, 30 to 40 exploration licenses. On land, uh, roughly one, uh, exploration, uh, one mining project results out of a thousand exploration projects. So there is, uh, I, I, I don't think there is a reason to uh, assume that the success rate will be higher on the deep seabed mining. So it, it's, it's really a, a small, surf, so small part of the oceans that might be affected by this. So that's the, 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 the background. And let me just give you a couple of my <clears throat> conclusions, observations, if you like. And I start with the deep seabed mining. Five minutes. Oh, plenty of time. Uh, it's technologically difficult, and it's unproven except it, it, after 50 optimistic years. I'm, I'm very uh, doubtful about this. Second point, there is no mineral reserves. Mineral reserve is what you need in order to start a mine. If you don't have a reserve, there will be no mine. And reserve is simply something, uh, a deposit we can be profitably be mined. On the International Seabed Authority, I haven't spoken about that at all, but as I said, it governs all the uh, extraterritorial uh, areas. And I find it a very interesting, unique, global ex-ante mineral regime. It takes a long, it's taken a long time, it's slow, but that depends on the fact that it is a democratic organization, one country, one vote. Uh, so I think ISA is, a, is an underestimated organization. It also has a lot of opportunities for developing countries, and, and um, it is something which should be followed and could perhaps be uh, up, uh, what is the revved up, uh, to use the title of the conference here. In offshore mining, I think the opportunities for low-income and middle-income countries lies really in offshore mining, as Namibia has shown, as Indonesia, Malaysia in their tin mining, and uh, there are other uh, ways of approaching this also. 
Mauritius is a country which have very actively used the opportunities that ISR opens for developing countries, and they built a, a cadre of knowledgeable people that can act as, uh, you know, lawyers, technical people, etc., that can act as experts around the world. There are serious uh, environmental issues, whether it's offshore mining or deep seabed mining. And continued studies are necessary here. But I, uh, there has been called for a moratorium on deep sea bearbearing. And I, I'm, I'm a bit worried that we'll rather be shooting oneself in the foot. Because if there is a complete moratorium, all research will stop. No funding will be uh, funneled into d d d that type of research to understand the, the, the bio biology and fauna in the depth. I think one should rather have a, a reasonable uh, way of strengthening the International Seabed Authority to continue the work on the, to solve these problems for the future. My second, by, uh, last by second is that, you know, whether it's a land-based mine or a marine operation, it will be the lowest cost producer that will, will start working. And, uh, <clears throat> that that's something that uh, often is o over overlooked. Uh, it doesn't matter if if one could do deep seabed mining. If it's more expensive than uh, land based, it will not happen. And I think also the environmental alternative cost should be considered. What is the alternative cost for a, a copper or a cobalt mine on land compared to the nodules? I've come to my final point here, and that is the, the, the blue economy perspective. The, the deep seabed mining or marine mining in general should always be weighed against or together with tourism, fisheries. It's a blue economy, and you have to take the, the whole picture into account before moving ahead. And I think I promised you to say something about taxes. Have you forgotten that? I have not. The um, metals company, which is now going ahead, they say, with this Nauru D project, they have um, projected profits, uh, revenue, profit, sorry, of $1,800 per year in their operation. Nauru and the company has not published information about the tax flows. But if uh, the, uh, another company that was Nautilus, it's now in, in bankruptcy, they published details on their deal with Tonga. And if you use that, those figures, and compare, calculate the income for Nauru, every year it's $8 million. So that's the uh, two figures, $8 million to Nauru, $1,800 to the company. Thank you very much.